Uh, Brother Kenny Glish is from down in Georgia. We all, our Georgians almost outnumber our Tennesseans tonight, uh, but that's okay. Uh, they're they're a close strike, right? And uh, I have confidence in this young man. And uh, uh, when uh, Jared told me about him, he says, "Young man down in Georgia, I want you to listen to." Me. And I thought, well, he must be three or four years old if Jared's calling him young. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged uh, because of the next generation. Um, sometimes when you get to my age and you begin looking around, you're like, what's, you know, in the flesh, what's going to be uh, next? But what I've depended on, what I've learned to depend on is this, God will raise up whom he will. But it's encouragement when he does. So, Brother Kenny, you come and uh, you tell us how good we are, and we'll go back to the house. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Well, good evening, church. It is uh, it is wonderful to be here again, and uh, I understand I owe you a bit of explanation. So I wanted to bring this up here so you could <laughs> see that I had a coat tonight. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, with the loose tie and the no coat, I felt like I needed to explain. But we're just going to blame that on Adam and his, his new Wi-Fi air conditioner. Uh, we came in, it was 82 degrees. So I, I felt like it would just not be the Lord's will to wear a coat this evening. Uh, but, no, the sentiments are the same here, brother. And, and we are so thankful. My wife and I are so thankful to be able to be here with you tonight here in Dover at New Testament. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed the meeting uh, last, was it May, and what a, what a great fellowship that was, and our hearts were just knit to this area and to you people, and, and we're so glad to be able to return. And it is also an honor to be able to commemorate the 20th anniversary of New Testament Baptist Church. What a great uh, joy that is to see that the Lord has not just a people, but has an assembly. Amen. And I am so thankful that uh, the Lord Jesus made that promise that he would build his church. Amen. And I believe God's given me some direction for these days here when I'll be with you. Uh, you know, Paul said to Titus in Titus chapter number three, concerning the fundamentals of the faith, and we do believe in fundamentals, so we're not fundamentalists. Uh, we're not reductionists, but there are fundamentals of the faith. And Paul said of those fundamentals, this is a faithful saying, and I will that thou will affirm constantly. And so there's some things that should be affirmed constantly among us. Amen. And when I think about the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, the fact that we're coming here in these days to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the church, I was wondering, well, what would the Lord Jesus have to say personally about these uh, core principles, these doctrines that have been so precious to us as Baptist people down through the years? Uh, and I started asking myself, well, what, what are some of them? And now I understand that uh, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen. And from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21, it is every bit as much of God's Word. Uh, but I think that there are some things that we should pay uh, special attention to uh, simply because they were spoken and given to us directly by the Lord Jesus Amen. at the beginning of this thing called the local assembly, the New Testament church. Amen. And so in these days, I want to preach to you three messages. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at what uh, Jesus believes about God. What Jesus believes about God. Lord willing, tomorrow night it will be what Jesus believes about the church. And then Friday night, what Jesus believes about redemption. Yeah. That is in case uh, the Lord does not change our course. I, I want to be humble and I want to serve him and be open to his leading in these days. But I feel like that is the direction that he has given me for these days. So if you have your Bibles with you tonight, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number one, and again, we're going to be looking at what Jesus believes about God. When you found your place there in Revelation one, I'd ask that you stand in honor of the reading of God's word, and we're going to begin reading at verse number nine. Revelation chapter one and verse nine, uh, the Bible reads, I, John, who also am your brother and companion 
in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day Amen. and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet were like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Amen. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and of death. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name uh, for this word that we've read. We thank you for your church, Lord. We just ask that you'd lift up your son tonight, uh, Lord, that he would be glorified, that all praise would be unto him, uh, that, that you would magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in this meeting, uh, that you would use the word of God to revive your people and quicken those who are dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, Lord, we just ask these things in Jesus' name, that all glory and honor be unto thee. Amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. No church, no ministry, no believer can ever rise any higher than their exalted view of Christ. A high view of Christ leads to a passion for and a pursuit of holiness, Amen. lofty worship, reverence for the Word of God, high regard for the Lord's church, and a commitment to spreading the gospel. A low view of Christ leads to casual worship, irreverence in the presence of God, compromise with worldliness, a neglect of the Word, and a low view of the church. You tell me your view of Christ, and I'll tell you what your state of worship is. Right. You tell me what your view of Christ is, I'll tell you your standard of holiness. You tell me your view of Christ, I'll tell you your zeal in evangelism. How you see the Lord Jesus Christ sets the tone for the reality that is your Christian life. Amen. And in contemporary Christianity is played with a much uh, too high view of man and a much too low and simplistic view of God. Right. Amen. When many think of Jesus Christ, they think in a babe and a manger. Uh, they think of a kind carpenter from Jerusalem. They think of a man of sorrows who prayed in Gethsemane. Uh, they see Christ beaten and hung on a cross. And indeed, they should see these things, for all of these are true of him. But this alone does not tell the full story. Right. In order to see the whole story, we must see Christ as he is now. Amen. In the present. We must see the exalted and glorified Christ. Not just the Christ in the meekness of his humanity, but we must see Christ in the majestic awe of his radiant glory. Amen. We must look upon the Lord Jesus Christ with one eye on him as he was 2,000 years ago. We must never forget his work upon the cross. But let me remind you tonight that that is a finished work. Amen. He is no longer upon the cross. He is no longer bleeding. He is no longer broken. He is no longer humble. That is who he was. And we must never forget 
what he came to do. But we must also see him for who he is. Amen. Right. Now, we must look upon Jesus with one eye upon him 2,000 years ago. But we must keep the other eye riveted and fixated upon the Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen. That this is the Christ who has been exalted as sovereign and Lord over all, to whom all judgment has been given. That this is the Christ who is the risen head of the church and the king of his kingdom. That this is the Christ who ever exists in the fullness of his attributes. Amen. That this is the Christ to whom every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. That this is the Christ who is coming again. That this is the Christ that we as his people must see. Amen. That this is the Christ that we are to declare to the world. And who better to reveal this picture of Christ to us than Christ himself. Amen. So as we look here at Revelation chapter number 1, there's several things I want you to see. The first is the servant's directions. The servant's directions. In verse number 9, I want you to note that here we find the beloved disciple John, and he is in the midst of a minute's persecution. Mm -hmm. He has been banished to the island of Patmos, which is something like a concentration camp of the Roman government. His crime? Believing in the word of God mm -hmm. and placing his trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And now John here is, is an older man. He, he is towards the end of his life, near the close of his ministry. And some might think here tonight that surely uh, by this stage in life, God was finished with this servant. Uh, but we see here tonight in this text that God still had a work for John to do. And God was going to sanctify John and make him fit for that work. Amen. Perhaps some of you are at that stage in your lives and in your ministries. In verse number 10, we find the beginning of the, the servant's directions as we find that John, in these conditions, found himself in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Amen. Uh, this reveals to us that uh, Jesus Christ visited John in a supernatural realm and began to unfold a marvelous vision unto him. And Amen. he says here that he heard a voice, and he described it as a great voice, as of a trumpet. Uh, John did not hear a hush. All right. Uh, John did not hear a whisper. Oh, uh, but John heard uh, this thundering voice that came booming out of heaven with piercing clarity. Uh, all throughout Revelation, uh, this loud voice is a symbol of the solemnity of what is about to be proclaimed. This voice that John heard, it, it could not be mistaken. Right. And it could not be ignored. This voice demanded to be heard. In verse 11, the voice begins to identify himself to John and issue him instructions. John was commanded to write a letter to seven literal, local, right. and visible churches. Amen. And let me just say that these are the only type of churches that there are. I, I'm not real smart, but I'm not real dumb. <laughs> And I know enough to know that you can't write a real letter to an invisible church. Right. Amen. And so he wrote this letter to seven literal, local, invisible assemblies. Amen. Yeah. And I want you to see that during these perilous times, as John is in the midst of persecution, a wicked emperor it is at the helm of the Roman Empire. Christians are suffering left and right. The Lord Jesus Christ takes time to write a letter to his churches. Amen. And he doesn't give them a 12-step plan on how to overthrow the Roman government. Right. He, he doesn't write them a how-to avoid persecution step by step. And it's not that Christ was unaware or apathetic or indifferent to what was going on in Rome. Uh, no, but it is that God recognized that the greatest need of the hour, uh, what the churches really needed, uh, was a revelation of Jesus Christ Amen. so that they might behold him in his glory. No more about who he 
is and be encouraged to magnify his name in their day. Amen. May I submit to you that this is and always has been the need of Lord's churches. You're right. Amen. This is the need of all of God's people. It was their need then and it is our need today. In fact, if there was ever a time when the people of God needed to receive a, a fresh glimpse of their wonderful Savior from His Word, it is today. But what we need is not to see a certain man in the White House, but we need to see the God-man seated upon the throne of the Lord. Amen. We need a Patmos experience. Amen. We need to see the Lord as He is. And who better to show us this picture of Christ than Christ himself. Uh, won't, won't you pray with me in these days that God would be pleased to manifest his presence to us and allow us to enter in and worship him and behold his glory. These are the servant's instructions to write this letter, but now I want you to see the self-description in verses 12 through 16. The self-description, the contents of this vision. Notice in verse 12, John turns around to see the voice that spake with him. And John did not turn around because he didn't recognize the voice. But John turned around because he did recognize the Amen. voice. And John was not satisfied to only hear, uh, but John wanted so desperately to see. Right now, as the word of God is being spoken to you, Oh, I pray that you would have this same desire, not to be satisfied to merely hear the words of God, but to see the God of glory, to see the, the author of the book, not just to read the pen, but to hear the voice and to see the face through the eye of faith Amen. of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we see here is the most detailed view in the entire Bible of the glorified and exalted Christ. Right. Amen. This is who he is. This is who he's always been. This is who he's always going to be. And we've become so complacent. We, we have a desire to look upon the God man as he is. We, we, we like to think of a harmless babe. We like to think of a meek and lovely carpenter. Oh, away with this image of a man who is deity, who has all power, who judges sin. That makes us feel uneasy. Mm -hmm. But this is Christ as Christ sees Christ. And this is what Jesus demands us to believe concerning who he is. And let all unbiblical impressions, and let all preconceived notions about who we think God is fall by the wayside and be cast out of our minds and let us bow tonight to the word of God Amen. and let us know the Lord Jesus Christ as he would have us. Amen. John's instructions were to record this self-revelation exactly how it was given for the seven churches of Asia Minor and for the benefit of all the saints in all ages after them. So let us note several things here about who Christ has revealed himself to be. First, I want you to see that Christ is the power of the church. He's the power of the church. When John turned around and saw who it was that spoke to him, he saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of those candlesticks, he saw one like unto the Son of Man. Amen. John sees Jesus here in the midst of his churches. He is never on the outside. He is never on the perimeter. He is never in the subsidiary. He is always in the very epicenter of his churches. He said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, uh, there I am, uh, not on the outside of them, but in the midst of them. Amen. Amen. This speaks of his continual power and his presence that he promised when he said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Without him and apart from him, we can do nothing. Right. Uh, for all power on heaven and earth has been given to him, and we have no power aside from the power of Jesus Christ. But in him, in him, that power is delegated to his assembly. And we then have the power to fulfill the work that he's given us to Amen. Do, To serve him joyfully and carry out his commission to evangelize the world and make disciples of every nation. 
We see that these churches here, these seven churches, are represented by seven candlesticks. And we know that seven is the number of perfection, and all of these churches represent all of the churches of all ages. I, I don't think that we can limit it to say that uh, they represent merely different ages in the church age, uh, but I think that you can find a representation of all of these churches throughout all of New Testament history. Amen. And the purpose of a candlestick is not to draw attention to itself. Uh, but a candlestick serves as a lampstand, as a holder, whereupon a candle is placed. And right. the sole purpose of the candlestick is to shine forth the light of the candle. Amen. Now, let me tell you that the primary ministry of the New Testament church is not to magnify itself, not to glory in its own programs, not to shine forth the light of its preacher, uh, but it is uh, uh, to see that the light of Jesus Christ goes out into all the world and that all honor, all glory, and all praise goes unto him. Amen. Amen. Christian worship is unlike any other kind of worship. Amen. We don't worship a brave martyr. We don't worship a heroic religious leader. We don't worship a wise philosopher who is still in the tomb. Uh, but we worship a risen, a glorified, and exalted Christ who indwells and empowers Amen. his churches. He is the Amen. power of the church. Secondly, I want you to see that he is the priest of the church. Notice with me, at the end of verse 13, that he was clothed with a garment down to the foot, and he was girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Uh, this attire, especially this golden girdle, speaks vividly of a priest who ministered in the Old Testament temple. And how fitting of a garment is it for our high priest, who has sprinkled his own blood upon the mercy seat, Amen. who has reconciled us to God the Father, and enabled us to have fellowship with the triune God. Amen. Amen. There he sits at the right hand of the Father, and he ever liveth to make intercession for us. It's like this. When we, as his children, stumble into sin, the Holy Father begins to move in divine and just wrath and condemnation toward us. And then up stands our great high priest. Yeah. And he turns to the Father and he says, uh, Remember what I did on the cross. Amen. I have already died for that sin. You've already punished me for that sin. You gave me justice. Give them mercy. Amen. And what a privilege it is. Yeah. And an undeserved comfort to have such an advocate yeah. to represent us before the Father. Yeah. Amen. He's the priest of the church. Also, I want you to see that he is the purity of the church. The Bible says in verse 14 and verse 15, and his head and his hairs were white like wool. Now, this speaks to the immaculate and perfect holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You see, holiness is the essence of our Lord, and it qualifies all of his other attributes. His love is a holy love. Amen. His grace is a holy grace. His wrath is a holy wrath. His sovereignty is a holy sovereignty. Of the crown jewel and the royal diadem of Christ is the gem of holiness. Amen. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that he is love, love, love. Nor does it say that he is joy, joy, joy. Uh, he is not peace, peace, peace. Uh, but thank God that the Bible says that Jesus Christ is holy, holy, holy. He is a trice holy God, and there is not one speck of black. There is no sign of any spot or stain in this verse, but it's only unblemished white. Allow me to magnify my God here and say how that Jesus Christ is absolutely perfect. Amen. He always does right. Amen. He never errs. He never sins. He is impeccable tonight. Amen. His person is holy. His word is holy. His judgments are holy. He is completely innocent, totally undefiled, and absolutely separated. Amen. John writes in 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. Amen. Oh, if we could but get a glimpse of his holiness. Yeah. If we could begin with our fallible human minds to, to touch the breadth of his holiness. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, how different our churches would be. Amen. How radically transformed our worship would be. Yeah. Oh, how much stronger our zeal to reach the lost would be if we but knew how wondrous and holy our God is. And let me tell you that he demands that his people be holy even as he Amen. is holy. Amen. Amen. And he has set himself up as the divine yardstick. He is the standard. Compared to one another, we may fare well. But compared to the utter holiness of Jesus Christ, all of us here tonight have fallen far short of yeah. his high mark. Amen. That this holiness that he demands of us, though, glory be unto God, is not derived from our own efforts of striving in the flesh. Rather, this holiness that he demands of us, that was that, that, that is the holiness of Christ, secured by his own obedience, his active obedience, living 33 years, never erring, never faltering, Amen. always doing right, doing the perfect will of God the Father, fulfilling every jot and tittle of the law, that is his active obedience, which gives us a positive righteousness. Oh, but then there is his passive obedience. How he humbled himself. Amen. He was in the death of the cross, and he went there uh, willingly of his own volition, and he stayed there until the work was finished. He did not say, I am finished. He said, it is Amen. finished. And that was his passive obedience as he willingly laid down his life for us. And this uh, gives us the freedom, no condemnation from all of our sin. Oh, uh, it's not enough just to be free from sin, but we have to be positively righteous. Wow. And through the Lord Jesus Christ, the great transaction that occurred on the cross, our sin to him, his righteousness to us, we credit it as his obedience, him punished for our iniquities. Friend, that is the gospel. Amen. 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 And so this holiness that he demands of us tonight, we cannot secure it by our own words that are right. as filthy rags. But this is a holiness which he merited on our behalf. And he works out practically in our lives as he purifies his people. Titus 2.4 declares that the purpose of Jesus' death was to purify a people unto himself. Amen. Uh, but not only is he the purifier of his people, but he is the very purity of all who believe upon him. Amen. And if you are his child tonight, he will ensure that that holiness is worked out within you. Look what it goes on to say. That his eyes were as a flame of fire. He ensures the purity in his people because he sees with an all-seeing eye. Now this speaks of his omniscience. But Jesus sees us with a searching, revealing, infallible gaze that penetrates deep into our souls. Amen. He sees us with X-ray vision. He sees in our lives and through our lives. He sees into every church and every church member. To each of the churches, he will go on to say in chapters 2 and 3, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works. Amen. Now, there is nothing we can hide from his eye. Amen. He looks into the depths of every human heart. He sees the most isolated reaches of your thought life, your most secret inward desires. Hebrews 4.13 says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He reads you tonight like an open book. Right. Amen. What a convicting thought this is. Amen. He sees every sin. He sees every failure. He sees every fault. He sees every time that the gospel was preached unto you and you rejected it. The things that we have successfully hidden from everyone else, he sees. Yep. Amen. There's no purpose in lying to God tonight in your heart. Right. He's already seen it. Amen. It is open unto him. And this should cause us to fear him with whom we have today. Amen. Oh, but friend, I want you to see that this is a convicting thought, but yet it is also an immense source of comfort for the believer. Because this all-seeing eye, what this means for us is that when we are as low as we can get, as we sit there on rock bottom, he sees the tumult in our heart. Amen. He looks upon us with compassion. When we are struggling, and it seems nothing is going right, 
When our family and friends are forsaking us, and when the world is despising us, he sees our inner desire to please him, and he is satisfied Amen. with us. Amen. In those times when frustrations overwhelm you, in those moments when no one understands you, when you feel all alone, a Jesus sees. And oh, how this should encourage us uh, to pursue holiness with everything that we have and do all for the glory of God, knowing that we have a Lord who takes personal and compassionate interest into the affairs of our lives. Amen. Because he's watching with an all-seeing eye. Amen. In the good, in the bad, in the ugly, he is there. Amen. This is how he ensures the purity of his people. I want you to see also how he protects the purity of his people. Notice what the Bible says there at the end of verse 15, or the beginning of verse 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And brass typically signifies judgment. And here it refers to Christ's unmitigated judgment against sin. And, and in keeping with the context of this passage, this letter that was written to the churches, I believe this is especially referring to the judgment that he finds within his own body. 1 Peter 4.17 says that judgment must begin at the house Amen. of God. Amen. And Christ manifests his purity by moving about us, even here tonight, with these flaming brass feet that have been scorched in the furnace. And he's judging whatsoever defiles and whatsoever profanes. Because he loves his people. He cannot allow them to continue in their sins. Because he loves his church, he cannot allow those things that would pollute and corrupt to enter in. Now, I cannot see in your heart tonight. And it would be legalism for me to go through a punch list of your sins and to warn you about what you're doing wrong. I, I, I don't see in your heart tonight. Oh, but I would encourage you to somberly examine yourself Try. tonight mm -hmm. and see what things in your life need to be crushed Amen. and destroyed by these flaming brass feet. Amen. Confess those things when you find them. I do not cling to them. I say, Lord, stomp them out of me. Amen. Cast them away from you. Know that it is better to enter into life maimed and pure than to be wholly cast into hell and stomped upon with these flaming brass feet while you're desperately holding on to the filth of your sins. Right. Get them away from you. Amen. And again, not only are these feet convicting, but it is also very comforting because we see here that it is Christ who has the final judgment. Right. And he is vested in the good of his people. He doesn't judge us because he takes pleasure in punishing his people. And in fact, he doesn't punish, but he chastens. And he conforms for our good. And friend, it is Christ that will have the final say on your life. Amen. But remember that as you are judged by others, condemned by men, ostracized by the world, you will not stand before them on the last day, but before Jesus Christ. Let this free you tonight from the courts of public opinion forever. Let this reassure you that your trials in this life are not in vain. That your life and your work that will be unfolded before Jesus Christ and he will know, he will see, it will be revealed unto him that you sought to please him. Amen. And to hear from him on that final day, but well done, my good and faithful Amen. servant. Oh, this will fill our hearts with joy and overcome all of the criticism that we received in this life. Amen. Serve the Lord with gladness. Let me tell you tonight, keep your convictions. Maintain your standard of holiness. But don't worry about appeasing sinful men. But don't worry about what they say to you. But don't worry about the false accusations. But don't worry about the sneers. Don't worry the gossip. Don't worry about the thoughts of those who, who don't have the purity that you have that was given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ for it's not them that will have the final say on your life, but it is Him. Please Him. Serve Him. He's the purity of His church. I want you to see fourthly, He is the potentate of the church. Amen. Earlier, His voice was 
described as a great trumpet. And here at the end of verse 15, the Bible says that his voice was as the sound of many waters. I, I believe that John was here receiving this voice, listening into this voice, and he was struggling to find words to describe the ineffable sounds in which were coming through his ears, and as he was searching for adjectives, searching for some description, I think perhaps maybe one of those tropical storms that blew on the shores of Patmos entered into his mind, the loudest thing he had heard in years, and he thought this is the only thing comparable unto this voice. Amen. This voice speaks from a place of unrivaled Authority. This voice is the voice of the potentate of the church. That there is not one maverick molecule in our universe, but that it does the bidding of this voice. And no other voice carries more weight than Amen. this voice. That this is the sovereign, imperial, commanding voice of our Lord. And the church must not obey any other voice besides this voice. This is the voice that spoke the world into existence. Uh, this is the voice that called into the tomb, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. Uh, this is the voice that commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. Uh, this is the voice that cried out, it is finished, as the eternal redemption of all God's people was accomplished. Uh, this is the voice that will shout forth as the shout of an archangel when Christ returns to receive his own unto himself. Uh, this is the voice that will say to the redeemed, well done, my good and faithful servant. And this is the voice that will say to the damned, depart from me, I never knew you. Right. Yeah. And this is the voice that speaks to you right now Amen. from the word of God. You must not ignore this voice tonight. You must not turn a deaf ear unto this voice tonight. Amen. Uh, but whatsoever he saith to you, do it. Humble yourself to him. Yield to this voice. He is the potentate of the church. Amen. Fifthly, I want you to see he's the protection of the church. Look at verse 16. And he had in his right hand seven stars. These seven star stars, I believe, refer to the pastor, the pastors of these churches. The symbolism here. I would say applies to the whole body. As the pastor, we believe as Baptist, is a member of the local assembly. Though he is the one that God has appointed to be the bishop, the overseer of the body, he is a member. And so here we see the Lord Jesus Christ as he holds his churches in the palm of his right hand. And the image here refers to this controlling protection. You see, when a baby is in the arms of his father, mm -hmm. he, he needs not worry whether he'll be fed. He doesn't worry about whether he'll be clothed. He doesn't worry about whether he'll be loved. He, he's not concerned with falling to the ground because he is protected from all things that could harm him by a loving father. And in like fashion does our Lord providentially preserve and protect his people. The psalmist says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet right. have I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging Amen. bread. And as long as Christ has a work for us to do, then we can trust him to preserve us and provide our needs. No place is more secure for the child of God than to be in the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have a an enduring hope. We have a solid rock. We have a firm foundation. We need not worry about come what may, hell, high water. The Lord Jesus Christ says, through fiery trials, thy pathway shall lie. My grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. Amen. He said, when through the deep waters I cause thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not be overflowed. Amen. He's going to sanctify to us our deepest distress. And we're going to come out of the furnace. We're going to come out of the temptation. Like John the Baptist said, or excuse me, John Bunyan said, that the Christian in the fire of persecution is like Esther in the perfuming chamber. I guess he was John the Baptist. He was a Baptist too. Right. Yeah. He said the Christian in the persecution of fires like Esther in the perfuming chamber being made ready for the presence of the king. Amen. And so here we find ourselves 
You see, I, I don't believe that he's going to come back for a pessimistic, downtrodden, and defeated people. I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns, he will come back to receive a glorious and triumphant people unto himself. And the apple of his eye will there be the bride of Christ, the made up of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will be adorned as the bride unto her husband in the righteousness of the saints. He is the purity, he is the potentate, and he's now protecting his church, keeping us like a chaste virgin that we might be presented Amen. fully unto him. Amen. He goes on as he talks about the protection of the church. He says that a sharp two-edged sword went out of his mouth. And many commentators uh, exclusively define this as the word of God that comes forth out of his mouth. But uh, the word of God has already been described and identified. His voice has already been detailed for us. I, I believe that this is rather a reference to how our Lord protects and preserves our spiritual health by cutting out of us all things that defile it. We had a relative recently, my wife and I, and she was a younger lady, and they thought she had appendicitis. Mm. And you know that the appendix, I know I've got some healthcare workers here tonight, the appendix naturally does no harm to the body. But as a result of the fall, we are uh, corruptible. If that appendix bursts, if that appendix ruptures, if immediate medical attention is not sought, the whole body could die. Yep. I, I want you to see your sins like that tonight. I want you to see your indwelling corruption like that tonight. I want you to understand that you have something within you that has ruptured. It has burst. Uh, and if you do not cut it out of you, if you do not get rid of it immediately, it, it will take you down and it will yield death to your entire body. Amen. Amen. Until we start seeing the seriousness of our sin, we'll never do anything to rid ourselves of them. Amen. Amen. As Spurgeon said of this sword, he said, what a two-edged sword it is. How it kills the self-righteousness. How it cuts the throat of our sins. Lays the dust of the dead at the feet of Jesus. How all subduing is this sword of the Lord. And no sword of Gideon was ever so potent against the horde of Midianites as the sword that comes out of Jesus' lips against the host of our sins. But when the Spirit of God comes in all of His power into our souls, what death He works within us, and yet we live. Amen. What death to sin, and what new life and righteousness. O oh, Holy Sword, O oh, Breath of Christ, enter into our hearts and cut out our sins. And tonight we need to be praying earnestly that the Lord Jesus Christ, that through the power of His grace, would cut out our sins, throw them on the ground, and stomp them out with His flaming breath. Amen. Jesus does not merely protect us from getting sad. He does not merely keep us from stubbing our toe. He does not merely hinder us from getting a flat tire, but he protects us from our own depravity. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. Lastly, in this self-description, I want you to see that he is the prestige of the church. This is the culmination of this mighty and awesome vision. Here is the face of our Lord Jesus Christ in verse 16. And it says that his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. He is here brighter than 10,000 noonday suns. Here is the unfiltered, unveiled glory of God. Now this is the glory that filled the temple in Isaiah's day. And this is the face that Moses could not look directly upon or he would have surely died. Now this is Christ shining forth in sublime perfection. Now this is the sum and substance of all that Christ is. This is the blazing, bright, intrinsic glory of God. This is our theme as the church of the Lord Jesus. Oh, if we can only show one message to the world, if we can only preach one theme, it should be this glorious truth of who Christ is, brighter than the sun shining in his strength. Thirdly, that was the self-description. I want you to look now at the solemn dismay. The solemn dismay in verse 17. 
You see, John understood something of this mind-boggling, heart-arresting, knee-bending, awe-inspiring vision. But John understood that it was impossible to come in contact with the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ and not be affected and not be changed. Amen. He fell on his face as dead. He grasped something of who Jesus is. And let me tell you that his response was entirely appropriate. And Jesus did not rebuke him for behaving this way. Right. Now, when he fell before the angel, he said, I am, I am in the same boat as you are. But here, falling before the Lord Jesus Christ, his actions were perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. and, and, and let us tonight take this as a warning that, that we ought not be so casual in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And we've become so familiar. We've become so complacent. We've heard it before. It's been preached to us before. And we're irreverent. We're unchanged. Mm -hmm. And yet we expect God to do something for us. When he's already giving us himself. When he's already preaching to us his word. And we're turning a deaf ear to it. When it's not moving us. When it's not changing us. When it's not convicting our hearts. When it's not burdening us to worship him. Oh, may this not be in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us have uh, this righteous but solemn dismay in the presence of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. But I want you to see the Savior's deliverance. You see Jesus there looking upon John with compassion, reading him, knowing what was going through his mind, uh, perceiving the thoughts of his heart. And Jesus laid his right hand upon John, and he assuaged his fears, and he comforted John with a reassurance of his person and work. I want you to see what he says to John. He says, fear not, I am the first and the last. Uh, this is an exclamation of his deity and an affirmation of his eternality. He is the first, he is the last, and by implication, he is everything in between. Amen. He is all and in all, and all things are of him, through him, and to him. Uh, this is the bigness of our God. Amen. And then he goes on to say, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Now this designation would have had a special significance to John. John, the beloved disciple. See, when Jesus was upon the cross, all the disciples fled. The shepherd was struck and the sheep scattered, but not John. Now John was the only disciple that followed the Lord Jesus all the way to the cross of Calvary. And John was there when the Lord Jesus was nailed to the cross. Right. And John was there when he said, Mother, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. And John was there when that spear was thrust into his side. And John was there when he bowed his head. And we had those three hours of darkness. And John was there as he said, Father, into my hand I commend thy spirit. Amen. And John was there. As Jesus cried, it is finished. John saw Jesus die. John understood better than any man that has ever lived what it means when Jesus says, I am dead, but I am he that liveth. Right. Yeah. No doubt this memory of Calvary's cost was racing through John's mind. Uh, but John was also there at the tomb. When it was discovered that the Lord's body was no longer in the grave. And he ran into the tomb. He witnessed the resurrection. He knew what his Lord meant when he then proclaimed, I am alive forevermore. John had this intimate fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the Lord Jesus introduced himself to John here in verses 17 and 18. All John could say was, yea and amen, you the Lord have done it, I have handled you, I have seen you, I have witnessed it. This is the solemn, the solemn dismay and the Savior's deliverance. He is alive forevermore. And I want you to see lastly as we close, the sovereign declaration. The sovereign declaration. You see the ultimate source of John's comfort that came from this declaration of Christ there at the end of verse 18 when he says, I have the keys of hell and of death. But what does this mean? Well, this means that he is the Lord of death. 
This means that death is a defeated foe of the cross. Uh, this means that, that he has overcome the grave, that death has no hold upon him or anyone who is in him. Amen. And there is yet coming a day when our Lord will exercise his ultimate sovereignty over the grave. He will open every tomb. Uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first, uh, and we will be there to meet our Lord. In Amen. 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 It is not enough for him that he has redeemed our souls, but he will have our redeemed bodies as well. He will have the final word over death. And we not, need not fear death, for we cannot die until our Lord turns the key. You're right. Is in his hand, Amen. For he has the keys of death and of hell. Amen. This is what John saw in his day. Oh, and friend, this is what we must see in ours. It was already said tonight that, oh, what a great work of God it is when he quickens those who are dead in sin, when he saves them by his grace. Oh, but what a mighty work it is when he revives his own people. Amen. And this is what John needed. This is what we need. And we must ensure that our view of Christ is aligned with Christ's view of himself. We must believe about God what God believes about God. So as we close tonight, let me ask you this. What are you going to do with this text? How can you ever enter into his presence without a holy reverence ever again? How are we going to have this vision fresh and ever on the forefronts of our mind? Are our churches going to be trendy and trite or timeless and transcendent? Amen. Uh, we must stand in awe and amazement of who our God is. Uh, let us be astonished at his greatness. Let us be amazed at his glory. And let us ascribe to him the worship that is due unto God Amen. alone. Amen. Yeah. He is alive forevermore. That's it. Amen. 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 Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and we thank you for this revelation of our altogether lovely Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray tonight that you would use this text of Scripture uh, to quicken the hearts of your people, to make us alive uh, unto thee in, in a spirit of worship that is in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I just ask tonight that you uh, put a special blessing upon this meeting. Help us, myself included, to be serious about what we're doing in these days. Lord, let us worship you. Let us praise you. Thou art worthy, O Lord. We love you tonight because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. No.